Hi, hi everyone. Um, I think we can start. Yeah, a few people maybe will join us in the after. So let's begin. So thank you for joining our webinar about the next generation of ADAS for your fleet. Uh, we've seen in the last few months a growing demands for, for smart camera-based AI. And there are lots of companies, fleet telematics service providers, fleet companies, and more approach us asking for more information about adding AI into their solution. So we've been deciding thinking that this can be a very good opportunity for us to share our knowledge, to share our experience with you and talk with you about it. So before we start, a few notes. This webinar is recorded. At the end of the webinar, it's gonna be a Q&A session. So feel free to add your questions in the Q&A. And let me present our chief scientist and co-founder, Asaf Moshinsky, that will lead this webinar. Asaf, you can start, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, so before we dive in a little bit about myself, uh, for the last 10 years, I've been researching and developing applications for a different computer vision task using both classic computer vision and deep learning. I have a lot of experience doing that both from the industry and the academy. So today I want to talk about, about how we build this uh, automotive uh, computer vision system at Roman 17. At Roman 17, we're building the most efficient ADAS that has top accuracy and can run in any commodity low power dash cam. We're a team of AI experts that have developed a unique patented technology that allows us to do that. Our technology is already being used and tested by our customers worldwide. So today I want to show you what we consider to be the holy trinity of ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems for fleet management. And uh, by that, I mean deploying AI for video telematics on the edge. And uh, due to the new extensive uh, capability list and the AI accuracy that this technology brings, this combination is now becoming the de facto standard in safety checklist. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to start with talking about the video of fleet. What's it good for? How does it compare to other sensors? Then I'm going to discuss the AI for video analytics, which feature does it have? And why the accuracy is the number one important thing and how we can achieve that using deep learning algorithms. I'm going to talk about real-time constraints and how to run um, deep learning models on the app and end by explain to you how we do all of that at Roman 17. So uh, the importance of video for fleet is, is not really debatable. A lot of uh, telematic service providers have already installed cameras in their devices. The, the only thing is that this the camera is now working together with the other sensors, usually accelerometers or GPS, and provide some sort of trigger that causes a video segment to be sent to the cloud for manual analysis. The problem with these sensors are that they are blind. They are great for providing information about the vehicle, where it is, how fast it's driving, if it's stopping abruptly, but not much more than that. Video can give us a more complete understanding of what's going on, and especially outside of the vehicle. And it's able to detect pedestrians, other vehicles, traffic lights, and, and more. And of course, that all this information is very, very important because the more we know about the driver and the environment, the better score we can provide per driver. But more importantly, we can improve the safety of his driving and, and everyone around him. So there are a few cases, for example, the harsh braking, um, where the sensor provides a, a trigger, the accelerometer provides the event, and then the camera recording is sent for manual analysis. And in these cases, the camera can really tell us what's going on. We know if this braking was because a pedestrian was uh, running into the street, into the road, or because the driver was not keeping enough distance from, from the car in front of it. But there are also other cases where the camera is actually crucial for even recognizing these events. For example, if we look at, at this video, 
we're going to see a car in the right lane crossing a, a red light. So in, in this event, none of the other sensors can really help us recognize that anything happened here. The car was just driving at the normal speed. There was no accident. And if we would have relied on these uh, sensors, we wouldn't have known that something out of the usual happened here. But the camera tells a different story. The camera can recognize that there was a traffic sign, traffic light, sorry, and the light was red. And combining that with the additional information from the sensor, we can recognize that the car was driving through a red light. And these are actually the cases that we want to recognize the most because these are cases that we wouldn't have been able to, to capture otherwise. And if we can catch them in time, we can act accordingly and therefore enforce the, the maximum level of safety. So now that we all agree how important the video is to automotive safety, it's easy to understand why these cameras are already available in many, in many dash cams. But the problem is that these dash cams collect millions of hours of driving every day, and it's really impossible to analyze all of this data manually. This is why we have to rely on trigger from other sensors. And this really limits the, the quality of analysis that we can do. If we have an automatic uh, processing system like artificial intelligence based, we can basically pro process all of the data automatically. And by doing so, we can produce much better analysis. Um, the AI, AI can analyze large amounts of data at, uh, at lower cost than human labeling. And by doing so, more events are recognizable. And therefore, we can provide better driver scoring per driver. Another benefit of applying uh, AI is that we can have immediate feedback. We don't have to rely on hindsight processing of manual review, but instead we have an ongoing analysis going on all the time. And this means that we are able to have real-time notifications for the driver. And this is very important for driver coaching. We can always go in hindsight and talk to the driver and tell him you're not keeping enough distance, you're not using the signaling enough, but it's much, much better if we can give him an indication in real time that he's doing something that's wrong. For example, if a driver is crossing lane without signaling, it's very easy to recognize that and trigger some alert that will increase his awareness of these bad driving habits. And over time, this will cause him to, to change his behavior and drive safer. So, so this is one aspect of immediate feedback, but on top of that, we can actually prevent accidents by being able to alert the driver in real time. If there's an imminent collision, we can just trigger the alarm and this will allow the, the driver enough time to press the brakes and prevent the accident. So now that we talked about the advantages of automatic analysis first manual review, let's see the ADAS features that uh, are available today or at least the most essential latest features and see exactly what they do. So the first one, or maybe even the most important one is headway monitor warning or HMW for short. In this feature, we recognize the vehicle ahead and this allows us over time to estimate the distance between us and that vehicle. This allows us to also estimate the relative speed. And if the car is driving too close to the other car, it's very easy to trigger an alert that will cause the driver to keep more distance. So for example, if a driver is driving at 90 kilometers per hour, such an, um, you will have to keep more distance than a driver driving at 60 kilometers per hour. And if we trigger such alert in time, it will cause the driver to, to keep more distance, but we can also aggregate the feedback from this feature over time and it really tells us uh, a story about which drivers have a problem of not keeping enough distance. So let's see an example of this feature. Here we can see that the object detector is able to detect the vehicles and track them over time, which allows us to compute distance and the HMW score. 
once the HMW score drops below 0 0.5 second, then the HMW trigger is, uh, is alerted. And we can see that the bounding box is colored red. In the vehicle, this will of course be also accompanied by some uh, audio cue or something like that that will let the driver know what's going on. The next feature is forward collision warning or FCW. This feature um, monitors the road ahead, similarly to the HMW, but warns the driver from an imminent collision, which means that instead of the HMW just making sure we're keeping enough distance, here the FCW is used to prevent accidents. Here we can see an example from a real car driving on the road where it doesn't have such a system installed. And as you can see, it results in a crash. But, uh, but our algorithms were able to detect the vehicle becoming closer ahead of time and triggering the alarm. If uh, the car had such a system installed, he would have enough time to respond and press the brakes and by doing so prevent the accident. The next feature is the lane departure warning, or LDW. In this uh, feature, we detect the lanes and the road markings, and this allows us to recognize where, when the vehicle drifts from its lane. There are two types of LDW. The first one is lane departure without signaling, which requires a connection to the, to the car's computer. By doing so, we can recognize events of crossing lanes, and we can check if the signaling is enabled, if that doesn't happen, we can uh, alert the driver that uh, the event was recognized and, and over time, as we discussed, it will cause him to change his behavior. The second type is the solid lane crossing. The solid lane crossing does not require a connection to the, to the camera, to the car computer, and it only requires us to recognize the line type and the location relative to the car, and that's enough for us to know when the, when the vehicle is crossing a solid lane. This is a great example how, how vision can work on its own. We don't need to have the car computer to generate the solid lane crossing, but if we combine it with the car, this additional information can make the feature even stronger. Let's see an, an example of this feature. In this feature, you can see that uh, the lanes are detected. And for each of those lanes, I'll pause one of the frames so you can see it more clearly. We compute the, the margin for each of those lanes, basically the distance from the car to each of those lanes. And once we are crossing the lanes, this, the, this is recognizable by the margin. And the lane is colored in red. Let's see it again because it's very short and I'm sure that most of you missed it. So we can see that the alarm is triggered whilst, once the crossing happened and it's disabled when it goes back. The next feature um, is recognizing a new type of object. If before we talked about vehicles and, and, uh, and lanes, here we're talking about people. The vulnerable road users, or VRU for short, recognizes people either walking as pedestrians or riding a bicycle as cyclists, and is able to, to alert before a collision, similarly to the FCW feature, but for, for people this time. And, and this is a great example for a feature that was not possible without vision and without AI. So in these cases, accident that would uh, involve these very vulnerable road users would not have been recognized without the, without the AI system. And here we can actually prevent them, and in this case, maybe, maybe even save lives. The next feature is the traffic sign recognition, or uh, TSR for short. In this case, we're recognizing various types of traffic signs, including stop sign or speed signs, and this really allows us to, to make sure that the driver is, right, is driving according to the, to the road conditions. Um, it, there are other solutions such as HD maps that can be used to record 
the location of those signs and combined with GPS, we know where the driver is. But the problem with such an offline data is that it's harder to update and it can't really respond to, to, to changes. Um, unlike a video that can recognize, let's say, a construction area, and if there is a reduction in the amount, in the speed allowance, uh, we, we know that and we can make sure that the driver is, is adapting as well. So it, it goes without saying that for any, all of these features that we saw, the accuracy is the number one priority. If we have this feature, but they're not accurate enough, at the worst case, it's going to generate information which is not useful, but it might even cause the driver to act. For example, if we have an error on a false coll front collision warning, this might result in an actual accident if the driver brakes and the car behind them is not ready. So accuracy is very important and really should be our number one priority. Let's see an example to see why that's true. So let's say we have a system that has only one false FCW alarm per hour. This might not seem like a lot, but if we're looking at the big numbers, if we're looking at a small to medium sized fleet that has around 1000 vehicles, this will accumulate to, to five false positives per hour, per, sorry, per minute, which is really a lot. And any fleet manager that will have to handle such a load will basically want to shut the system down and not use it because it creates more noise than actual helpful information. So when I'm talking about accuracy, let's, uh, let's see the different error types that, that we can encounter. Here in this image, we can see an example of a vehicle detector output where each uh, detected object, each detected vehicle is denoted using a green rectangle around that vehicle. In this case, we can see that the first error we see is the pickup track, which is not recognized. We see that because there's no green bounding box around it. Such an error is called a false negative or a miss. It means that we, that we didn't detect something that we should have detected. The second, the second error is the, is the false positive. We can see that the traffic, the traffic sign on the right is recognized. And while we want to recognize such, a, such a traffic signs for, for traffic sign recognition features, here this traffic sign is classified as a vehicle, which makes it an error or a false positive means we, we detected something that we didn't want to detect or we didn't have to detect. So how does, uh, how does these errors look in the real world? Let's play a, a little game. Who of you can tell me which of those images are a stop sign and which image is a Burger King uh, logo? I'll give you a minute because it's a really a tricky one. But uh, I, I assume that at least most of you, if not all of you, were able to recognize it very easily. But for uh, one, one of the Tesla vehicles, it was much harder. We can see here a video which you might have seen online or read about, in which uh, a Tesla autopilot recognizes a Burger logo as a stop sign. So right now the, the, the sign is pretty far and we can't see it uh, well in the image, but the car already recognized it, which causes the car to slow down as we can see here from the, from the speed measurement. So these kind of false positives are, are very risky. It's really an edge case that maybe no one in Tesla thought about checking or didn't encounter, but it can be very risky. If we're using this feature for statistics only, then we might have some noise in the data and that would be okay. But whenever the car acts upon this information or it alerts the driver and he might act on it, then here the accuracy is becoming really, really important because if the driver um, would have stopped on the side of the road, then it might have caused an accident with a different vehicle. And, and really in this case, nothing happened, but this is not always the case. As we can see here, our nice friends at Tesla 
really help us demonstrate the errors, and in this case, it's a false negative, we can see an overturned truck on the road. And the human driver are, are recognizing it very easily. You can see that all of them adapt and just change lane and, and avoid it. But this car that you're now seeing is crashing directly into it. And why does this happen? It happens because their automated system failed to recognize this rare event as actually something that it has to, to react to. And, and in this case, as it usually happened, the human driver gets uh, accustomed to the, to the autopilot and does not pay attention to the road. And by doing so, you really rely on this system to be accurate enough. And as we can see, even if it's very, very accurate, it's not accurate enough. So now that we understand the different error types, let's get back to the numbers. For, for a fleet manager, a rate of more than five false alarms per, per minute is really a lot. But if we consider this from the driver perspective, there are many, that many false positives will really cause him to lose faith in the system and just ignore it. And this really makes it not useful for us. On the other hand, like we've seen in the, in the uh, Tesla truck case, the missing a single event, even if it's very rare, can result in an accident that might even cost lives. And, and for these reasons exactly, this is why accuracy is the number one priority. So the question is, how difficult can it be to reach high accuracy? And of course, that it's very, it, it can be very difficult in some cases. In this case, even for us humans, it might be difficult at first to recognize um, which images contain chihuahuas, the dogs, or which contains a uh, blueberry muffin. But since our, our vision system has evolved uh, for millions of years, we're now very good at, at looking at stuff. So we're able to recognize very quickly which features in each of those images help us recognize if it's a dog or a muffin. And after a while, your brain is very adapted to these changes and you can recognize, as, you can recognize these differences almost immediately. Now, the inter interesting thing is that this is very similar to the way that the vision algorithm works. We are teaching these algorithms to recognize, to recognize different objects or events by showing them examples of, of real-world real data. And by looking at enough examples, the algorithm can learn which features are informative to ensure the maximum accuracy. So if we want to have the highest accuracy possible, we must use the most accurate technology, and this currently is deep learning based. Currently, most solutions are not using this technology, and instead they're using classic computer vision. Classic computer vision is mostly based on manually engineered models, which are quite small, and therefore have limited accuracy. So what, what do I mean when I'm saying manually engineered? If we want to design a new classic vision algorithm, we would have a, a researcher or algorithm developer sitting in some office looking at enough data, and he will have to decide which feature is going to, to feed the model with, and this will let, him, uh, let, let the model know which features are important to work with. Now, if we're relying on an algorithm developer to do all this manual work, it's really unlikely that he will be able to cover all of the scenarios that, that are required uh, for such system. For example, we saw the very rare case of the Burger King sign or even rare case of the, of the truck, of the flip truck. But there are much more challenging cases that can happen on a regular basis, such as driving in nighttime or rain. And we want the models to be accurate enough to work in, in all of those scenarios. Now the solution for that is the newer methods, which are based on deep learning, which is inspired by the way that the human brain works. These models are very, very huge, and they are learned automatically and does not require the manual engineering that the, the classic vision uh, requires. And therefore, they have much higher accuracy and robustness. So here's a selected few example of how difficult it can be in the real world to have high accuracy. We can see the different weather conditions, lighting conditions, 
and basically just a never-ending list of difficult scenarios that our algorithms have to work in and not to just work we must have the highest accuracy possible whatever the situation is and for that we really have to use deep learning algorithms so here's uh, one example of how difficult it is to to drive in the rain the rain itself is creating some artifacts or occlusion but even more than that the windshield wipers are constantly moving and occluding the vehicle now for us humans it's very easy to handle it we're used to it we're driving like that almost every day um, but for algorithms that were not designed to handle this scenario it's unlikely that they, that they will work well in these scenarios and um, especially algorithms that are that are based on motion will be completely lost in these scenarios for deep learning algorithms it's a completely different uh, picture because it's similar to the way that the human brain works it, we can teach it to ignore the windshield wipers simply by showing it examples of of such uh, such scenarios if we show enough scenarios during training the result will be a model which be very accurate and very robust and can overcome even scenarios that it wasn't shown so it it's pretty it's pretty clear that accuracy wise deep learning is the answer it's very very accurate but the problem is that these models are often huge and complex. And usually these algorithms need to run on very powerful processors in the cloud, such as NVIDIA GPUs. But the problem is that even if we don't take into account the, the cost of such a service, that the communication with the crowd, with the cloud really prevents real-time feedback, which is crucial for our applications. We want to be able to prevent accidents. We want to coach the driver in real time and if we're working with a cloud just a communication to the cloud and back does not really allow us to do that so we really have to take a look at the hardware that's available for us to use at the edge and there are some version of edge gpus but the problem is that these solutions while physically they can fit inside a, a dash cam it's pretty expensive and on top of that the power consumption is really, really high, which makes it impractical also from a technical standpoint. So combining all of that, it, it's pretty clear why we don't see these edge GPUs in real product. You can really count on one hand the number of uh, dash cams that have such GPUs. Now, one of the most common edge processor units is the ARM CPUs. It's, of course, because it's very power efficient and even the pricing is relatively low, but the problem with these CPUs is that they have much lower compute power. And if we want to run heavy deep learning models on those CPUs, then it really becomes a problem. So in this case, the middle ground is really to have a dedicated hardware, like the one provided by chip manufacturers Umbrella and Renesas. This is a hardware that was designed specifically to run deep learning models on neural networks or the convolutional neural networks. And in this case, they're able to run it very, very efficiently. And they are specifically dedicated to only run these types of operations. And because unlike CPUs or GPUs, which are general purpose, uh, general purpose uh, processors, then these processors are able to have both the high compute power of a GPU, but also be very power efficient. So we're able to integrate them into our edge devices. And on top of all of that, they also come with a relatively competitive pricing, which makes it a, a really good option for us to use. So by now, I hope that we can all agree how important it is for ADAS applications to run deep learning based video analysis um, in real time and on the edge. And we talked about the challenges of deploying such systems, but now let's see how we at Broadband 17 solve this issue. So we talked about the hardware and 
even if in the dedicated uh, hardware there's still the compute power limitation and usually the most deep, current deep learning solutions are based on open source algorithm such as SSD or YOLO and the way to to run such solutions on edge devices is to reduce the size of this network but the problem is that this operation makes us lose the accuracy and accuracy is our number one priority which makes this kind of solution really unacceptable for for uh, automotive uh, cases at broadman 17 we built a unique uh, architecture that we designed from the scratch to handle exactly these kind of scenarios we designed it to be able to have to be very large models that have extremely high accuracy but to be still be able to run on on any platform and in this case we're able to achieve that using calculation reuse of the network and weight sharing um, of the of the model weights and thanks to this unique approach we can really deploy accurate solutions to any platform even the arm cpus that that we saw earlier so in the last four years we've been collecting large amounts of data we talked about the importance of having a wide range of scenarios to make sure that both for training your models are able to encounter as many possible scenarios um, as, as possible and also for testing you want to make sure that you get good coverage of, of all of those cases. So you can see here example of our algorithms running on the data that we collected worldwide. Um, we ran these algorithms and trained them in data from Taiwan, Korea, Israel, US, and, and more. So now we can see how all of this, uh, how all this works together. We will see a demonstration of a video recorder here in Tel Aviv by our fleet demo application that demonstrates our latest capabilities. You will be able to see that we detect both uh, the vehicles and the lane. And for each of the vehicles, we compute the distance and the HMW score, and we're really able to respond in real time and alert before the car uh, collides or if it gets too close to another vehicle. So I, I hope that the audio worked and you are also able to hear the, the, the audio indication. And I have to say that from, from our experiments, it's driving really well. And even as I was taking the car for a test drive and maybe not paying attention, this feature was really helpful a couple of times in uh, indicating that, that something is wrong and I need to pay attention. So in conclusion, I hope that we can all agree now um, why we see the increase in demands for this next generation of, of fleet ADAS. We have, working with the camera and working with AI, we have more features, more information, and it really improves both the, the safety of the driving, but also the driver scoring, which is very important for, for these applications. Thanks to deep learning, these solutions are much, much more accurate than ever before, which is very important to make it more robust and work well in any scenario. On top of that, we have real-time feedback, which, which provides real-time, uh, real crucial real-time information for both the drivers, but also the fleet managers. We saw the challenges of building and deploying such systems in terms of accuracy, in terms of compute power. And this is really where Broadband 17 technology shines. It enables us to, to build very, very accurate deep learning models that can still run very efficiently on edge devices. And this is really what helps us fuel the next generation of, uh, of fleet ADAS. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, we have uh, time for some questions. So let's start with the first one. We have a question, let me see. Uh, what is the long term goal for the system? Will data from other devices such as traffic light cameras be used, can be used to help to predict dangerous situations? 
So uh, I, I think that one of the, the main reason that, that we see an improving accuracy is because we have more data today. And we can really use any data that we have to make the system better. And if it's external system, it might be incorporated as well. Um, but basically anything you can, you can do to improve the accuracy is of course uh, recommended. Thank you. Uh, the second one is, is it ready for customers? Yeah, of course. We already have customers that have deployed the, the system, sold it to, to their customers and driving on the road and making their driving safer. Okay. Another question is, how do you handle cases like Tesla that we've seen before? So I, I think these two examples were, were really great in showing how difficult this task is. And this is why we put a lot of effort on collecting data, which is as varied as possible to make sure that you have the highest accuracy. But in the end, these systems are still not 100% accurate. So this is why it can't be full autonomous at the moment, but still have to rely on, on a driver paying attention to what's going on. Okay, and the last one, is Broadman 17 providing closed solution or algorithms behind? So what we're providing our customers is uh, we have different levels of offering. We can offer just the perception. Some of our customers take that and build uh, the advanced features on top. Some of our customers want the complete solution and we offer it either of these two options. Right, and I have another question here. Can you, give, can you give any indication of what kind of computing you would need in terms of MIPs and memories? So uh, I'll answer it maybe in a, in a broader sense. Um, if you ask what are the minimal requirements in terms of memory or compute power, it, it, really, it really varies with the list of features and the requirements that you have. But generally speaking, the minimum we have to run is uh, A53 ARM cores. Usually it comes with, uh, I would say a few hundreds of megabytes, which is more than plenty. We, we have worked in systems that have much less than that, even as low as four megabytes, but it really depends on the, on the application and the features that are required. Okay. Thank you all for joining and attending and for your time. I hope it was beneficial. Uh, the, the webinar recording will be available at our YouTube channel in a few days, so feel free to enter and see that. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact us. You can give your details in the website and we'll be, we will be returned to you as soon as possible. I hope you enjoy and have a great day. Thank you, Asaf. Thank you, everyone.